Hello and welcome to the final video that's going to finish off 1.1 cells and movement across cell membranes in unit one of WJC GCSE biology. The final topic for this video is going to be enzymes, what they do, how they're made, the, the lock and key model to try and explain exactly how they work and then finally, what is the effect of temperature and pH on their activity? Does it speed it up? Does it slow it down? What effect does it have on it? Once again, there are aspects of this which are considered higher tier only. So this statement there, that's really higher tier only. And this there resulting in the formation of enzyme substrate complexes is uh, made bold in the specification, suggesting it's higher tier. Once again, if, if you're doing foundation, I would still look at this. I would still try and get my head around this because when the time comes, when the exam is coming, it could be that you actually decide along with your teacher that you're actually going to do the higher tier. So I wouldn't ignore this. I'd try and go through it. And I really do think it does help you understand exactly how an enzyme works, particularly the, uh, the structure bit in terms of the, uh, the order of the amino acids. So if we go immediately over to the the figure that we've got here so we certainly don't need all of this what, what they need you to know and to understand is that first of all that a protein is made of amino acids so you imagine if the if the protein is this long necklace of beads then amino acids are the individual pearls that that be or the beads on the necklace and the order of these beads on the necklace has a profound effect on the final structure. Okay, you don't need to know that this is primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structure. That's A level. Um, you don't need to know that it forms pleated sheets or an alpha helix and, and they bind together to make the tertiary and possibly the quaternary structure. All you need to know is that different enzymes have amino acids in a different order. And even one change of an amino acid, if I change that red one for a green one or that green one for a blue one, that could have a profound effect on the final protein that's made. Okay, and if you start to look at, um, you know, if you're looking at something like evolution, we're looking at mutations. Um, this this is how mutations come about. So one little change in an amino acid gets a new gets you a new protein, and it could be that that protein brings about maybe an advantage. Okay, I'm going a little bit off task now, but um, this is all you need to know. So it's it's folded into a very specific shape and different amino acids are made of different, different enzymes are made of different amino acids. Now that specific shape bit is super important because if I've got this, these purple objects, if this is my enzyme, that bit at the top, there's very often an indentation there, and that's known as the active site. And the thing that actually, or the reaction that's actually going to be speeded up by this enzyme will fit perfectly into the active site. We say its shape is complementary to. Okay. Now, if you say the substrate is the same shape as the active site, sometimes in exams they can be a little bit fussy about that and they don't like you saying that that shape there is complementary to that shape don't say it's the same shape and I know that seems maybe a little bit too fussy but it is something the examiners have said they don't like so it's complementary too so you can see now because that site is so specific to the substrate to the thing that actually reacts in there only a small change in one of these amino acids if that affects that active site shape then the substrate will no longer fit into the active site, which means it will not speed up the reaction. Okay, because this is what enzymes do. Every enzyme is specific to a particular substrate and it will speed up that reaction. It doesn't change the reaction in any way, shape or form. It just makes it happen faster. Okay, so the example we've got here, we've got a substrate and you can see there when it binds together with the the enzyme, that is the enzyme substrate complex, that's what they've said is higher tier. But as I've said, I think you should just, you know, we should all learn this. In this case, that substrate is being split and we've got two new products actually being given off. Okay. Now you could just as easily have two products 
fit into the enzyme and be sort of knitted together to make a bigger substance, a bigger product, or sometimes enzymes just change slightly the shape of the substrate into a different molecule, depending on what they do. Okay. So what we're looking at, we've got an enzyme with an active site, we've got a substrate that with a complementary shape that fits perfectly, and you can probably see now exactly why they call it the lock and key model. So here's our key. Okay, this is the lock, and you're going to put the key into the lock, and I guess you're going to open the door to carry that through to the very, very end. Okay. Let's double check back with the specification. Enzyme control of chemical reactions in cells. So that's you know, simply saying that enzymes are what control those reactions. That they're made of proteins, made by living cells, which speed up or catalyze, because they act as catalysts, use the chemical term, the rate of chemical reactions. Different enzymes are composed of different amino acids. So as we said, those beads in a chain. If I was to chain, change one of those beads, I get a different amino different order of amino acids, which means I get a different final structure when it's actually folded into shape. The specific shape of the active site enables it to function, a simple understanding of the lock and key model, and to be able to interpret enzyme activity in terms of molecular collisions resulting in the formation of enzyme substrate complexes. Phew. So maybe to go over that a little bit, what they're saying there, the substrate and the enzyme they're going to be randomly moving around in this, the liquid substance, in the, the aqueous inside of the cell, for example, in the cytoplasm. And they must bump, in, bump into each other. They must also bump into each other with, a, with enough energy, I should say, as well. So if these guys bump into each other, um, then we're going to get an enzyme substrate complex. And then the reaction is going to happen. And that reaction is more quickly than it would happen without. I mean, this breakdown would eventually take place but with an enzyme you might be talking a couple of hours you might be talking a couple of minutes without the enzyme you, you might be talking several days so it makes a huge effect now straight away you can probably guess what effect temperature would have on this so thinking about your kinetic theory if we were to have an enzyme reacting with the substrate at a quite a low temperature it's going to be reacting at a certain rate but as I increase the temperature, because the particles start whizzing around more quickly, then there's going to be more collisions and more collisions with the right amount of energy for the reaction to take place. Now, this will increase and increase and increase. But at this point, this is the optimal rate. So this enzyme is working brilliantly at this temperature. But for some reason, then over this temperature, it just, it just drops off. OK, now what happens at that point is it gets so hot that the bonds holding together our protein, these, these, you know, this amazing shape, you know, this chain of amino acids folded and folded and folded again. If we increase the temperature too much, then the bonds holding all of this together start to get disrupted. And if they get disrupted, the shape of this will change. And if the shape of this changes, then the substrate can no longer fit in. At that point, we say it has denatured. That's the posh term to describe what happens there. So at that point, there's no point trying to get a reaction to go any quicker than this because you're just killing off your enzymes. You're, you're messing up the active site and it's no longer going to happen. Okay. Now you'd get a similar thing with pH. Um, you, if you were to do a graph of pH levels, so if I did my pH along the bottom and I had my, my rate of reaction on the side, you'd have a similar thing there. So you'd have very few reactions that are low pH and then at some point you'd have a pH that it works really well at and then it drops off the other side there. So we know this is the optimum rate. In an exam, they love to give you these sorts of graphs and ask you questions like, what is the optimal rate for this enzyme? It won't necessarily be there. In fact, for most enzymes, you'd probably find it's around body temperature 37 or 40 degrees around that okay um, some bacteria living in hot springs they, they, they work in sort of close to boiling point um, if we want to do an experiment where we're using where we want to control 
then what you would do is boil the enzyme to denature it completely. You're most likely to investigate temperature, failing that pH. Uh, the reason why I say temperature is, and we, we would do this with water baths, pH levels, obviously if we start doing particularly low pHs, particularly high pHs, then it's getting a bit dangerous. So in a, in a school laboratory setting, you might avoid this and be more tempted to go for this with water baths. The other thing you might look at are changing the concentrations. So you could train, change the concentration of the enzyme, for example, very easily, and you would do a graph of um, what happens as you increase the concentration of that. So what you'd expect there, it'd go up and up and up, and it would plateau off. The reason it would plateau off is because you'd get to a point where the enzyme is working as fast as it possibly can and breaking down um, the substrate that it needs to and at this point the substrate has become the limiting factor if you wanted to increase that again obviously you need more substrate and you could keep going on and on with that but i would say temperature would be the most common one that you would investigate and that is a specified practical meaning you will definitely do it within your school and it's very likely they'll have some questions about that in your exam albeit in a looking at from a, a experimental design point of view, how to make it a fair test, what sort of controls could you put in place, um, or more likely, I think, maybe to give you some results or a graph of results and to actually be interpreting them. You should be looking at your application. So back to the spec. I think now we've covered all of these. Enzyme control. Um, enzymes composed of different amino acids, the beads in the chain the lock and key model, which works quite nicely. So we've got a substrate and an active site whose shapes are complementary to each other, not the same shape, but complementary. And then finally, some of the investigations that you might do, I think that's gonna be a number one. I'd say that'd be a number two. Um, and it mentions here the effect of boiling, which denatures most enzymes. It says most because they have found, as I said, a few bacteria living in hot springs who can seem to operate at these extremely high temperatures. Thank you.